Commission on Circumvention of Technological Measures that Control Access to Works Protected by Copyright. We have a pretty full schedule today. We're going to have four topics, four separate uh, sessions to deal with those four topics. Uh, our first topic has to do with a proposal for literary works distributed electronically that contain digital rights management and for other access controls which either prevent the enabling of the book's read aloud functionality or which interfere with screen readers or other applications or assistive technology <coughs> that render the speech in specialized formats and are legally obtained by blind or other persons with print disabilities, as such persons are defined in section 121 of Title 17 of the United States Code, or are legally obtained by authorized entities as described in such section distributing such work exclusively to such persons. Uh, we have two panelists this morning on this proposal, Mark Rickard of the American Foundation for the Blind and Melanie Brunson of the American Council for the Blind. Uh, and with that, I will let whichever of you wishes to go first. Uh, you have up to the uh, speak. You have up to 10 minutes to present your case. Thank you so much. This is Mark Rickard, American Foundation for the Blind. And if I can, I just have one personal privilege. If folks who are on the dance will just introduce themselves and their title. Thank you, pardon? I'm sorry, I someone's losing right here. Sure if you all could just introduce yourselves and your titles so we know who's on the Yes, uh, David Carson, General Counsel of the Copyright Office. Rob Kasnick, Deputy General Counsel. Uh, Chris Reed, Senior Advisor for Policy and Special Projects in the Office of the Register. Okay. Excellent, thank you so much. Well, thanks again for allowing us to present today. We presented before you several years ago on this a similar topic, uh, and the exemption that we are proposing is somewhat different from the one which the Copyright Office and the Library of Congress has presented in the past. But we are back again because the problems that we've flagged in the past persist. And there are two areas. I don't really want to capitulate all of the points that we tried to make in our written testimony uh, that we at American Council for the American Foundation for the Blind did jointly. But this flagged a couple of them. And there are technological issues that prevent people who are blind and visually impaired, people with print disabilities as defined by law, uh, that inhibit their ability to access the text of ebooks that they have lawfully purchased or otherwise obtained. But there are also limitations in terms of those entities that try, admittedly the best, uh, to provide access to people with disabilities. We're living in an era here and now where, thankfully, more and more publishers are beginning to recognize the need for access to their uh, <coughs> works. And yet, we are at very much the infant stages of that effort. Uh, people are still struggling with how exactly to ensure accessibility. Sometimes they get it right, and many times they don't get it right. So there are really two things that we're concerned about. We're concerned about the, the persistence of these digital rights management controls, which often get in the way of a screen reader or other access technologies. But we're also concerned about this exemption and the need for it because sometimes the accessibility that is attempted to be put in place does not do the work. It is inadequate to our needs. So, in short, what we're hoping to do is to have the Copyright Office and the Librarian, again, recognize an exemption that would do two things. That would allow individuals who are going to visually impaired or those with print disabilities to circumvent controls when it's necessary to do so in order to actually get access to the text. And to also have the ability uh, for especially organizations, so-called authorized entities working on our behalf, to get around to circumvent such controls when it's necessary to improve the accessibility uh, that may or may not be built into a ebooks functionality. When I talk about improving accessibility, let me just give one illustration, and I'm sure Melanie will correct uh, the mess that I made as I do this. But you know. Right now, it seems as though people want to provide access by simply hitting a button that allows the book to read to you. It dumps speech basically into your lap or into your ear without much control over how that material is presented. And particularly in the education context, and you know, I'll just put in a shameless plug for the following panel. We're going to be talking, among other things, about the applicability of all of this stuff in the education world, and I, I, I want to say that particularly if folks in higher ed, it's particularly necessary to really be able to interact
interact in a robust fashion with the uh, with, with, with ebooks. And simply to dump text out without any real sophisticated way to navigate through the text, to be able to search on keywords, etc., uh, maneuver around. Those kinds of, of features are extremely important. Uh, so we don't see that kind of robust accessibility, and we want to make sure that when individuals, and particularly when organizations like authorized entities, uh, are improving accessibility for us, that the sometimes rather draconian provisions of the DMCA don't come crashing down to prevent that from happening. That's my summary statement, and um, we look forward to, to the dialogue and any questions that we have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Riker has um, described the concerns, the problem that we face um, pretty thoroughly. I don't have much to add at this point, um, except to um, expand upon the one aspect of, of controls that <clears throat> creates, I think it's fair to say, the, the, the largest headache for our community. I am a representative of a membership organization that is a representative whose members are um, come from all across the country and in fact we have um, several uh, members in foreign countries. The American Council of the Blind is um, the organization that I represent. And I think it's fair to say that one of the issues that arouses the most passion um, within our membership is the issues surrounding um, the ability to read books. And the one issue that I think causes the most consternation is the measures that for whatever reason, disable the um, ability to access digital books by reading them out loud. Um, that has ramifications for our membership that people do not have, um, <coughs> do not frankly uh, have nearly as much sympathy for as they do anti-piracy um, measures that are more directly um, related to simply preventing unauthorized use. And so there is, there is, um, there is a, a huge distinction in the minds of the average reader with a print disability when you talk about that particular issue as opposed to simply measures that are aimed at prohibiting piracy. We are here primarily because the digital book advent has the potential to level the playing field for our community in terms of access to education, in terms of access to employment, and in terms of our ability to participate in, frankly, um, the cultural and the community life of the society that we live in. However, we find ourselves, in spite of that potential, being frustrated by the measure of, uh, um, the number of measures that once again create obstacles for us simply because Nobody at any asp any level of the process, well, I shouldn't say nobody, because as Mr. Reich had indicated, publishers are beginning to look at access. But we have um, still, in the vast majority of cases, um, whether it's because the players won't read out loud or because the books have measures built into them that prevent, pre prohibit use of screen readers or read aloud functions on those limited number of players that do provide them, we have once again obstacles to our use of a technology that could very easily make it possible for us to be on a level playing field with people who do not possess the same print reading disabilities that we do. So what we're seeking is 
that degree of, of flexibility within the copyright law that would enable access to those works. Um, and and we are um, we are extremely interested in seeing that this happens. And I too am happy to um, answer questions and um, but that is the conclusion of my, my statement. Thank you very much. Um, let me start. Um, in reading your proposal, one comment struck me, a couple struck me actually, but the one I want to point to right now is a comment where you said, we want to be on the record that it is the experience of people who are blind and visually impaired that the shutting out of people with print disabilities from full and fair access is indeed a rampant problem, but this is not our burden of proof. What is your burden of proof in this proceeding? I think it's to, this mark, I think it's to illustrate that this problem that we have brought before the Copyright Office persists. And I think we've done that in our remarks, especially our written testimony, flagging both the limitations of the accessibility that some groups are trying to build in, and also the persistence of the digital rights management controls uh, that are still blocking access. I think, as we've tried to say in our written statement, even one instance where that happens and we know that it happens more than in one instance, uh, is a reason for uh, requiring a, an exemption to be put in place. Because we, it, it's not about if it's 10% or 50% of the market, it's about whether I, whoever I may be, uh, who have lawfully obtained a particular work can get access to it. And if I can get access to it by getting around digital rights management controls, I should be able to do that without incurring the civil rights the difficulty that you face is that you don't know yeah. whether or not you're going to be able to access the work until you have put your money down and purchased it, and then tried to use it. And if you're on a job, it can cost you your job. If you're in school, it can cost you <coughs> your class, and you have no alternative. What does our record tell us with respect to the extent to which electronic books are not available in accessible formats? I think in previous proceedings, again, this mark, in previous proceedings, we have provided the Copyright Office with examples of controls, uh, that works where controls have either intentionally or inadvertently blocked access. Uh, and in the last proceeding, we we're told that we didn't present enough of those. What we've tried to do in this proceeding in proposing a slightly different, we think hopefully clearer, <coughs> exemption is to take a more global view and to say rather than handing over a few isolated instances, five cases, 50 cases, 500 cases, <coughs> that in fact we are taking a more global approach to indicate that yes, we know from the experience, the stated experience of blind and visually impaired men and women across the country that control still poses a problem, and even when accessibility is attempted, there still may very well be a need to improve on that accessibility, and if that means we need to get around such controls to make that happen, we should be able to do that. Can you explain to us uh, the reasons why the proposed exemption that you have here differs from that which has been granted in the past? Maybe to describe the different features and the reasons for it. Okay, this mark, I'll take this first, and then, and then Melanie, if you want to help uh, support my mind, be great. I think there are two principal ways uh, that it's different. We understood the previous exemption granted to uh, indicate that if a version of a work, uh, a, di a slightly different version of a work was available, so let's say you had a Kindle version of a book and a Nook version of the same work, that access to one of those uh, works, if it's prevented by digital rights management controls, if the other product is available, then the exemption wouldn't apply. I didn't explain that very adequately, but I think you get what I'm saying. I, I, we understood that that was the purpose, and in fact, the, the, the letter and the spirit of that previous exemption. So we, uh, we recognize that the DMCA specifically says that exemptions that you all grant are only to be allowed in those instances where another version or an identical version of the work isn't reasonably available. And we simply don't believe that if a 
ebook, for example, is available on those two platforms, but one of them happens to pose accessibility troubles that somehow the users with print disabilities must use the other platform. Um, we simply reject that as a, as, as, as a matter of, of, of public policy. The other area in which th this exemption um, differs is that we are explicitly allowing authorized entities to do the work and to circumvent controls when the purposes of that exemption are, 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 are intended uh, so that we can streamline the process of, of, of providing access. It's, it's an awful lot to assume that an individual consumer with print disabilities uh, is going to have the technological wherewithal to, to pull off uh, circumvention. So we believe that an authorized entity who's doing work on behalf of those with print disabilities should be uh, should, should, should be entitled to avail itself of, a, of, a, of an exemption of what we're talking about. Okay, so there's two differences basically. Let's let's turn to the first one first. Okay. Um, and, and what I heard you say was you think as a matter of public policy, it makes no sense to uh, limit the scope of the exemption to cases where there is no format that is accessible. That's that's my word, but I think that's essentially what you said. Well, the only thing I would add to that would be I, I think the language of the DFC is good when it talks about not reasonably available, and I, I think we need to give some meaning to that. I, I don't. I, I, the whole point of this exemption is to make sure that the person with print disabilities can get access to the thing that he or she has purchased or otherwise lawfully obtained. We shouldn't be expecting, we don't believe, people to have to use, they, they may not want to patronize uh, another vendor for whatever reason. They may um, not be able to patronize because those formats are not necessarily interchangeable in terms of usability. Okay, well, let, let, let's explore that because the um, the you, you appeared before us several times, and this is, I believe, the first time we've heard you articulate this public policy argument. And I don't recall hearing any difficulties from you in the past about the way the past exemptions have been set up. So, what's changed? Has the marketplace changed? Has the way that people use ebooks changed, or has you, have you just changed your mind on what the good public policy is? I, I think uh, I think that the short answer to that is that the language of the last uh, exemption was crafted in, in an environment where there weren't the same kinds of we, we were trying to get as much as we could possibly get, uh, but I'm quite certain because. I think you and I had that exchange, the last thing on this public policy discussion. Um, if uh, yours truly wasn't as articulate as it needed to be, then hopefully we can make up for lost time now. It most assuredly is not a change of mind, it's a, it's a question of trying to make sure we get it right. Chris? Um, <clears throat> could you help us, I, I want to kind of continue that point on, on the marketplace. Can you help us understand um, the, the platforms that are out there. You, you mentioned the three major ones in your, your comments, the iBook store platform, the Kindle platform, uh, and the Nook platform. I understand Kindle, for example, you can actually read Kindle books on devices other than the Kindle itself. Um, what implications, if any, does that have for the accessibility of, of Kindle content? Well, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at this. Uh, being a public policy nerd means that I don't get to know the innards of uh, you know, technology as much as others in our organization do, but I'll take a stab at it. You know, a lot of folks who are blind or visually impaired, I'll just limit my comments to that, uh, are, are accessing Kindle content, obviously not on the Kindle, but using a PC that's specifically adapted for, for the, the purpose of trying to create access. That accessibility is, is not nearly as robust as it, as it needs to be or could be. Uh, but what it shows is that a person with print disabilities then is required to be grounded uh, to a PC or otherwise load, wander around with a laptop or otherwise find some way. In other words, they're not able to use the, the, the content on an equal basis with others. Um, I, I don't know if that's your question, but I, I think you know, the bottom line is we're in a era now where you, we have content that can be displayed on a variety of devices. We fear that even in such an environment, these copyright protections may block in our experiences that they continue to block access in a number of instances. Yeah, if I may just follow up on that, um, what we've 
part of the issue is the the access the, the book itself, and part of the issue is the extent of an individual's disability. Um, if someone has the ability to read large print, um, they have more options than than some someone who has no ability to read um, print off of a device's screen. And if one is limited to the accessing the book through um, a, a text-to-speech um, screen reader, then one has very limited options even with regard to the Kindle books. You can only use them on some Kindles. The, um, the PC app is, is really, as, as Mr. Reichert indicated, um, the most usable. Um, but there again, you don't have the uh, access to the um, navigation features that a sighted user would have using that book on either the Kindle or the PC app because the, um, the screen reader functionality is only limited to basic navigation and you don't have the ability to do the searches and the flipping to particular pages and things that uh, the sighted user not hampered by the allowed function has access to. Um, someone, there is also a Kindle application that is usable on iOS devices, but that, as I understand it, is not usable by someone who needs to read the book out loud. It is usable by someone who can use it um, to read a uh, large print but it is not usable by someone who needs to read it out loud. So um, there again, those are, those are, there are, that form of access to e-books um, does have serious limitations and all of the other um, functionalities have such, you know, they're not universally accessible. So if one were to make uh, the argument that, well, a Kindle book is usable, that would be, so we don't need to grant access to an iBook. Um, then what you're simply saying is, um, so that means someone who can read it using large print would be able to use it, but someone who is blind may be stuck. How much of that dynamic is a function of the device versus the book? file or the content itself? It is my understanding that it is a combination of the Kindle app and the book itself. And is that true for other major platforms, uh, distribution platforms of, of book content? Yes, I believe so. Because, for instance, um, iBooks that are created um, and sold in the iBook store um, one can use with greater ease um, than one can, for instance, Kindle books, unless you're using a PC. And that's actually where I wanted to go next, because you, you've mentioned broadly two types of accessibility. One is navigation and, and uh, navigability uh, for those who are blind and visually impaired, and the other is the ability to enable the read aloud function. Uh, in your comments, you've mentioned that the iBooks are accessible, and I'm just wondering, does that mean it has, they have uh, all, all books available through the iBook store have both of those accessibility features enabled? The Spark. <coughs> it's probably an exaggeration to say that every book in the iBook store I wouldn't want to make, I wouldn't want to swear to that. Uh, but their accessibility is generally, certainly, you know, the, the best of that which is out there. I, part of the challenge that we have is that not all people with disabilities are the same. And certainly someone who, for example, uh, may have significant learning disabilities that fall within the definition of print disabilities may require certain accommodations, if you want to use that term here, uh, to the content that, that might not otherwise be useful for, for other folks. So we know, for example, our colleagues in the autism world are struggling with, you know, how can we, for someone who has significant attention, issues or otherwise needs to have uh, content adapted in a particular way. If we render that material or that content in a way that's most useful for them, 
and, and we, in order to do that, we need to get around copyright protections in order to produce essentially work that makes sense for them. Uh, you know, we need to be able to do that. Um, so I, I think to, to folks who are blind or visually impaired, that I've only used personally the iBooks uh, stuff, to use the technical legal term, uh, <laughs> myself, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit. You know, I think their accessibility is is is, is generally pretty good. But I, I also wouldn't want to try, for example, to use in an iBook format a you know significant legal or scientific or other technical work that would require me to do a significant amount of navigation because of that those controls just simply don't exist there. Yeah. 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 On the marketplace point, you know, we've seen some evidence that the marketplace is evolving. Um, rather rapidly in this regard. I think just today, actually, there was an article about Macmillan uh, dropping DRM on a number of its uh, science fiction titles and launching an ebook store to sell those directly. Um, what impact does that have, if any, on your need for this exemption? This mark, I'll start with that, and that's uh, my to finish it for you. I think uh, it's an excellent sign. It, it, it shows, I think, that people are beginning to, to open up uh, to the realities of the marketplace. The fact that there's movement is that does not guarantee that a student over the course of the next three years, or an employee, uh, or someone, frankly, doing a, a, a government position, or any, any context, it doesn't matter. We can hypothesize any of those sort of situations, any of those scenarios, will encounter a book that has technological measures in it which may prevent use of screen readers or other, or other access software. And when that happens, not if, but when, and that individual or an authorized entity can make access possible, they should be able to do that without incurring the wrath of the DMCA. And, and so I think the fact that we, you know, we're not asking for a perpetual exemption, no doubt in three years we'll be back if there are, continues to be you know, persistent problems, particularly on the accessibility piece of this, not just the straight up or down can I get in, but how well can I use the content. But certainly over the course of the next three years, uh, as the marketplace continues to evolve, there's going to be a continuing need for this exemption. Um, with respect to your proposed exemption language, uh, you had mentioned that one of the major differences is the authorized entities piece. And I'm just wondering, if, do you really need that to get to where you want to go. I mean, can, if you had an exemption that simply enabled uh, circumvention for the purpose of making accessible, uh, inaccessible content accessible, which is, you know, which requires an underlying use, assuming the underlying copyright use is, is authorized under Section 121, um, do you need the exemption language to be written that specifically? This mark, I'll, I'll start with it again. Uh, Melanie is also uh, a lawyer, so she can uh, bail me out. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's like anything else. If it's not written in black and white, there may be a question as to whether or not uh, it's it's permissible. I, you know, over the course of the last, let's see, six, seven years, with the advent of the so-called Bookshare.org. Uh, effort and a textbookshare.org service, which a number of blind vision impaired folks, particularly students, have really found useful. It's one of several, of course, in our field, but it's really quite a popular service. You know, I, I know that the publishing world has been particularly spooked by, okay, well, if Bookshare could do it, where does this end? Who's really entitled to produce materials in accessible format? It, it's not the sort of thing where I think people who are in the publishing and, and you know, rights owners world um, would be comfortable with, unless we make it clear that you know, we're not talking about anybody being able to do this, we're talking about individuals who qualify and their representatives who are defined, we think, fairly strictly by law. So, I, you know, smarter lawyers, all of whom I'm sure are up on that dais, than yours truly at least, uh, may find that it's not necessary if that proves to be the case, then that's fine. I, I think we're just concerned that it, it shouldn't just be up to an individual to try to figure out, particularly in the technological area, how to make it happen. That if there are folks with some sophistication who can help make access possible, they should have the ability to do it. I think that for, you know, the, the sense that we've gotten 
in our discussions with publishers has been that they would feel better about individual about authorized organizations doing it than individuals anyway, um, because they would rely on the good faith of that authorized organization um, as um, as being a, a representative of someone who is in fact qualified and eligible to do it, as opposed to individuals. Certainly, you know we we. We have been proposing the idea that it should be allowable by either because it needs to be a, um, possible for someone who purchases a book um, directly from the marketplace. But it also is, is a, a fact in our community that for a lot of people, their first, um, the first place that they go or access to materials is an authorized entity, and therefore they um, they look to those entities to to provide the um, the expertise when there's an obstacle that needs to be overcome in order for them to get access. Okay, on the authorized entity issue, um, what it just occurred to me is <coughs> during the course of this discussion was I think. The language you propose might change the situation significantly in the following respect. And I, there may be a flaw in this because it just occurred to me, but I'll think out loud. Uh, with respect to the exemptions that we have had up until now, I think it's the case that in order for someone to take advantage of this exemption, they would have to have obtained a lawfully made copy, which means either they bought it or maybe somebody gave it to them, assuming the first sale doctrine applies in that environment, which is a very interesting question I'm not going to try to resolve today. <laughs> um, so at the very least, the publisher gets whatever the publisher's price is, and the person exercising the exemption gets the benefit of actually being able to read what they paid for. Not a bad deal for both sides, one might think. Looking at the language you propose today, I think what it means is that that's not going to happen. Now the reason I think that's what it means, but maybe I'm wrong, is that when you look at that second prong, what that will allow is it will allow authorized entities that obtain one legitimate copy to make as many copies as they like under section 121 and distribute them for free, meaning that that's money out of the pockets of the publisher. Now, maybe we don't care, maybe we do care. I imagine publishers care, but I just like to think through the ramifications of that and figure out if that's going to happen, should we be comfortable with it? And if we're not comfortable with it, should we try to build something in here that offers some protection for publishers in terms of their getting their piece of the action here? Uh, uh, Ms. Mark, a very fair point. I think <clears throat> it certainly was not our intent to a situation where publishers are not getting paid for what it is that they've done. We do feel, and this is admittedly an emotional issue, not so much a legal point or even a policy point, but we, we often get really frustrated with publishers who say, give me my chunk of change, even though I haven't bothered to do to lift your finger to make sure that you can get access to my material. Um, so I think we need to balance those two sort of competing points. How to do that in that language? I mean, if there's a way to indicate that an authorized entity isn't just freely distributing multiple copies of the same thing, of the same work to a bunch of folks without providing an appropriate royalty, um, you know, purchasing the, price, uh, the, you know, the, the, the work, <coughs> it certainly makes some sense. I think we want to make sure that well, what is being to the publisher is the, the, the fair price of that book in an inaccessible world, which is to say if I need access in a way that they can't provide, I should not be paying, for example, for an, or a more expensive audiobook format, some more expensive large print format. What the publisher or rights owner should be compensated for is the price of the mainstream book available to the general public 
because that's the standard against which we would measure fairness. Um, I also want to add caveat to this discussion, and that is that one of the reasons for proposing a situation that would allow multiple uses is um, that if I am a person who doesn't have a disability, I can go to any public library and buy or borrow that book without any regard for whether or not the publisher is going to get, make any money off of my borrowing it as opposed to buying it. And so um, I think what we also need to do is to be mindful of um, the, the, available, the right of people with disabilities to have the same opportunity um, that a sighted person will have to do that. In the current marketplace, is there anything akin to library borrowing for uh, accessible e-books? Um, Bookshare. Bookshare. Bookshare does sort of lend them out, but not permanently. Well, actually, no. Bookshare doesn't lend them out. You're right. The Bookshare allows you to, <coughs> to download them. Of course, there is the NLS, the National Library Services um, download site, which allows you um, there again, though. They don't require you to send it back. Um, unlike the, the traditional borrowing of the cassettes and the braille volumes, which you do have to send back when you download them, you, you, have to, you don't have to return them. So again, just, just thinking out loud, so no, there really isn't. If, if you're going to accommodate something like those two practices, what you're really doing, for better or worse, is telling any person who qualifies <coughs> under Section 121 to receive such works is you're telling them, well, you're not going to have to pay because uh, there are ways for you to get them from authorized entities without paying a dime. Is that accurate? Well, um, I, I guess I guess it is. Um, you know, the only other the only other thing that I was thinking is I think Net Library still does um, have a process whereby after you've had a book for so many weeks it goes away. And some of those are now available in accessible format. Uh, another issue, maybe it's not an issue, I have no idea, but it's, again, it's just sort of an issue spotting, I think, uh, with the authorized entities. Is there any history, maybe there isn't, I don't know, but is there any history with respect to copies that are in the hands of authorized entities being uh, sort of appearing on the open market, um, being used in ways that they aren't intended so that they actually cut into the legitimate market uh, to cited persons uh, for the works. And is that something we need to be concerned about if we extend this so that the authorized entities themselves have the ability to exercise this? Ms. Mark, I am aware of no authorized entity under that Chafee Amendment, Section 121, <coughs> that has been accused of allowing that to happen or has obviously been a subject of a suit. I, you know, so I, 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 I hear, we hear rumors of individual students who love to share things with other people. Um, quite frankly, if they did, they would be outside of not only the old exemption that you, you all were granted before, but outside the limit we're proposing. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily think that if that even were a dynamic, that, it, that, that, that it's something that can't be reached under the existing law even with our exemption in place. But I'm aware of no authorized entity, certainly none of the major ones, there's really only a handful frankly, that are playing in this space. I mean, we've mentioned several of them today, there are a couple of others we haven't mentioned, but this is not something that, that we have heard uh, either out in the hinterland or from publishers directly. Well, I think authorized entities are conscious of the precariousness of their position and don't want to violate um, the, the, um, the good faith uh, standard that they're that they're operating under, and so I think they have been very uh, careful. I, I believe that um, well, Bookshare we keep talking about, but they actually have notices on their website that if they catch you, they will suspend you and not allow you to donate anything or to download anything anymore. And um, they claim, although I'm not aware of the specific instances, that they have actually booted people out of the system and those folks are no longer eligible to, to 
come back and download books. So um, I'm not aware of any specific instances, but they have been um, very vocal about their willingness to protect the, the privilege that they have. Um, and I think that um, all of the, that the National Library Service has um, the same, the same uh, statements on their sites and they, um, they will go after you if they catch you. I did hear from the National Library Service of an instance where a couple of years ago somebody, I believe they said from the UK, got a book from someone in the US and advertised a copy of it on eBay. And they got, uh, they got tracked down and both ends of that transaction got, uh, got uh, taken to tax very quickly and that book was not on eBay. <laughs> and, uh, so I think, I think it's fair to say that everybody you know, in the community of users as well as in the authorized entity community is mindful of the rights holders' interests and the um, the nature of uh, the impact on them of what we're proposing, and nobody wants those. Um, the, nobody wants anyone's interests to be abused, and so we're perfectly happy with uh, with efforts to be as um, as diligent in pursuing abuses as possible, um, because I think um, that we. Uh, <clears throat> we are only talking, we're serious about only wanting authorized users. Now, Section 121, which is the section under which these authorized entities are <coughs> operating, requires that the copies distributed under Section 21 be in specialized formats exclusively for use by blind or other persons with disabilities. And is that a limitation that you intend to operate in the context of this exemption? Yes. Yes, yes. it is. They would have to. They would have to, they would have to, an authorized entity that's participating in the exemption that we're proposing would have to conform with section 121. Okay. I think we're done. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Right. Our next panel is scheduled to start at 10.30, so we have a 40 minute break.
Oh, they're doing it. Right. I'll leave the video and again. Yeah. You know, it's you got to go back to the 50 year old So you think uh, PK has any chance to get to the market section? That's the day. Yeah. 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 No checking email, I've been doing that, but I don't get it. Yeah. So where is the I can give I can give you the penny tour of the of the library. Yeah, that'd be great. But it's just get it's dark here, it gets really hot.
I mean, is this set up right here not? not I don't think this is working at all to have a reporter right between the um, yeah. panel witnesses. I mean, I'm happy. That's why I wanted, like, right where this, right where the uh, signer is, I wanted to have you. I apologize when we came over here yesterday. I know. It's set up. We got the. Well, we, 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 got, we learned as we went through the last one that we're not getting that. I can't do the exact same thing. Put the bad side. What was wrong with signing back where the was still after the signer was in the last year? Uh, 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 we want to get all the news on the and then I go back to the notion, can the reporter, can the signer be by that monitor? I'm not sure that's enough room up at the moment. I can start. Like, can show clips. Can, can you move that around? I have to shut everything down and then reboot it back to the time. We're going to have to do the market. Unplug the TV. We're not talking about moving down anymore. We're talking about moving to the forest. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, we're going to have to figure out the way to call it. What's that? Never mind, it's going to be just fine. Remove the board. Do I have electricity? Yeah, I think this is good. How many do you need? I think it's more energy. You just need one more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. That's fine. You know, I thought we were going to do. 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 I thought we were going to